Um, I've asked that the shades be brought down so people can have a little nap after lunch. Um, unfortunately, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break the view. One of the things I wanted to reflect on, um, Dave, it feels just like yesterday that we were at a Taranga Zoo um, for that uh, event, uh, which I think was the beginning of the revolution, really. This was when uh, Dave was at uh, State Forest of New South Wales, and uh, we were cooking up this idea with the uh, Sydney Futures Exchange to launch the first Carbon Futures Exchange. That absolutely did not happen. But, but fortunately, the revolution continues. And I think what New Forest is doing, and we were fortunate enough to spend uh, four days in Tasmania, is a great example of how the, the revolution continues. So um, it's a pleasure for us, representing the rest of the board of directors of Forest Trans, to be here. Um, and we look forward to the rest of today and the celebration tonight so, so well uh, deserved. Um, this morning we heard um, a lot about the, the wave and of growth of, of uh, institutional investors into the forestry space. And um, very impressive, of course, in terms of the, the volume of resource that they can bring to this equation. But to me, what was even uh, more interesting and impressive was the language that was being used um, uh, from many of the folks uh, this morning. Sustainability, David Blood and, and Generation, of course, are talking about that. Shared value, um, I, I love the Munich Re comment of investing forever. What a great concept that is and how powerful that is um, to think about um, some of the issues that we're working on when we think about forests. Um, I, I wanted to, 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 to switch a little bit from the investment side of the, or the plantation side of the forest picture to more the what, it, what we've been calling conservation forests here. And uh, Bettina Van Hagen spoke very eloquently about um, why they're important, carbon sequestration, climate mitigation, water quality, water quantity, habitat, biodiversity. Um, we all probably know that litany, but it's important to notice without those things, we will not have a planet to live on. So they are, they are very important things to take into consideration. Um, and historically, we've, um, we've separated out these two pieces of that forestry, of that forest landscape, plantations and natural or conservation forests. And I don't think it's been very effective. Um, I, I know that the, there's been a long history here in, in Australia that's very controversial about the forests in, in, uh, in Tasmania. We've, of course, seen that in the United States, in Clockwood Sound, in British Columbia, in Brazil, all over the world. This idea that we've separated these two things together has made them arch enemies. And I think part of the revolution that, that uh, Dave was starting to mention this morning is when we can start to think about how those different types of, of uh, approaches to forests can start to meld together and bring added value to both sides of the equation. For me, um, you know, we were also talking a little bit this morning about like what does it look in the what does it look like in the future, and I think we need to think about um, some of the things outside of you know wood pellet markets and sawn softwood and and to some of the larger drivers that are going to really make a difference in terms of the way we think about these forests and manage our forests going forward. You know, in, 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 in a very short time, we are going to be a population of 10 billion people. When I was born, 1955, there were 3 billion people. So in one short lifetime, we'll have tripled the population of this planet with all of the pressures that that brings. Um, we are going to need to, you know, multiply 10 times the amount of food that we were producing today to be able to feed a population like that. We're going to have... Um, more and more people in a middle class wanting to eat eggs and having wood in their lives and driving cars and doing all those terrible things that we do now. Um, so all of these things are really going to put a lot of pressure on, on the force that we have today. And, and I think the, the, the simple um, solution, the simple answer to the way we're going to make sure we have a forest estate uh, in the future is to, uh, is to add value to that forest. And this is where we start to think about um, the value or the, the important role that, that investors can play in helping us build that value, those suite of things that Bettina mentioned this morning that are all a part of what forests deliver, uh, planted and natural forests um, working together to be able to do that. 
What I wanted to do a little bit today is, um, is, have, is show a couple of slides, which is data. And sometimes data is important in a conversation. Other times it isn't. But, um, and it describes some of the work that we do at Forest Trends in terms of um, tracking these new emerging environmental markets. And I think it's a great way to start to think about this marriage between what has been historically conservation-oriented uh, work in forests with what the production side of this equation, where those surfaces are where we can connect. Yep. So this first slide, this is a, a report that's going to come out next week. So you guys are going to get a, a, uh, an early viewing of this. And what we do is, this is a report we do every year, which is the state of the forest carbon market. So we track all of the transactions globally that are around forest carbon. And what's interesting this year, and these are, this is data that, that is from 2014, so it's last year in effect, but, um, but we already know that, the, that the, uh, the payment levels of forest carbon reached in 2014 are now a historic high. Maybe not very large when you think about what, what uh, some of you investors are looking at, but the trend is really important. Um, it's over 45 million uh, tons of uh, CO2 that has been emissions that are, that are, that are sequestered, uh, which is, again, not a very big number. We need to be thinking in orders of magnitude greater than that. But it is more, it's more emissions than, than um, 135 countries have every year. So it's not insignificant when you think about this. Compliance is starting to play a role. You're starting to see California in this data. You're seeing the remains of what happened here uh, in, in Australia that, was, um, um, that closed down in 2014. Um, and then you see an important uh, player in all of this, which are voluntary actors. So when you start to, uh, to add together, the blue are, are these pay for performance voluntary carbon buyers. The orange in this is, um, is where you get public finance. There is a, is a big wave of, of interest from uh, countries to reduce emissions, led by Norway, led by Germany, led by the UK, a little bit of the US, that are all saying we need to invest in forests as a way to reduce emissions. So again, if you look at this picture, it's interesting to look across the tropical band. Uh, and it's interesting to think about um, that in the aggregate it's been over, it's about a billion and a half dollars that have been flowing to forests, forest management, forest conservation from uh, these different sources. Project types, you need to think about um, kind of where does, where does the money flow and so this chart again, the, the pattern is of course that it's growing and growing, the, the orange on the, well, did I not get that yet? So this is, uh, maybe I'll go back here. Yeah. So the orange on the bottom is, um, is red, which is a term that means reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation. Uh, it was created out of Copenhagen, and it's a way that uh, a number of countries decided they wanted to fast track investment into forests. Um, the, the bar above it, which is more of a red, is, uh, is tree planting. The uh, blue above that, the light blue, is forest management, and the top bar is uh, sustainable agriculture and agroforestry. So again, these are, these are surfaces that one can think about if you are moving into the space and you're worried about issues like risk and, and other partners. We also have, um, as you all know, uh, Paris this year is going to be the final meeting of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Uni United Nations um, UNFCCC, the climate negotiations that have been left, led by the United Nations. And while we are not going to have a binding treaty, which is disappointing to many of us after 25 years of negotiations, we are moving into a, a space where we're going to have uh, commitments that are made by lots of different countries. Um, and, and this is just the beginning of a sample of some of the commitments that, uh, that countries have made. 56 developing countries are making commitments uh, on reducing emissions based on forestry. 
So again, you're going to see a wave of movement in this space. Um, it's not enough to solve the problem. The calculation we have now is that it's roughly 50% of what is needed if we're going to get to a planet with only two degrees centigrade increase. Um, but I think it's a signal that, again, there's going to be a lot of movement in this space. Um, and, and it will be an interesting opportunity for the private sector to engage and partner in some of these different activities. An another um, interesting uh, train, if you would, that's left the station is um, this idea uh, and, um, and a set of commitments that were made this last year in New York City uh, at the UN Climate Summit, which are companies that are making commitments too. So you have countries that are making commitments and you have companies that are making commitments. And maybe even more importantly is the, is the business side of the equation where you have, um, now we're up to probably 180 different companies that have made commitments to move uh, their supply chains to sustainability with no net forest loss. Um, incredibly important when we think about the, the combination we were starting to discuss in this last panel, which is the driver of, de of deforestation these days is not illegal logging, it is agriculture, it's commercial agriculture. And that is roughly uh, two-thirds of all of deforestation globally is the expanding frontier of, of commercial agriculture. So the themes we heard this morning are really relevant. We need to stabilize that frontier. We cannot have agriculture moving into forests uh, otherwise, we're going to not have the services that forests provide. And maybe finally, this is a, this is a chart that, um, that, that starts to talk about what some of the, the, the aggregate of what some of these companies uh, rolls up to. So it's, it's, it's $4 trillion of activity that we're talking about from these companies. So it's, it's a very big player. 113 of these companies are in the timber and pulp sector. So we should be uh, watching those companies, uh, supporting those companies to move forward uh, when, we, when, we think about, um, when we think about the future. So I just wanted to lay out a couple of the potentially important drivers that are in and around the sector that we work with and provide some opportunities in terms of, of surfaces that we can attach to when we think about this idea of uh, moving from a forest estate that is about fiber and timber to one that, that uh, encompasses some of these other values and these services that go along with the products. So I wanted to just uh, maybe mention a couple of the, uh, the opportunities that I see very clearly. Um, and I, and I, would, I would break them down at sort of three different levels. Um, so we have obviously the global uh, movements that are happening, the negotiations at Paris we have um, to think about. And what will be interesting in those negotiations is that the big issue right now is finance. How are we going to be able to come up with the finance to be able to support all the activity we need to, uh, to uh, reach the goal of two degrees centigrade? There is, um, there is going to be a green uh, climate fund that's going to be developed out of this. Um, there are going to be, um, there, there are lots of governments like the UK right now and, and, uh, and Norway that are looking for ways to partner with the private sector. I think there's a great opportunity for a group like this to be able to participate in that because you don't want to have government bureaucrats building these financial instruments. We want to have people that have experience with these instruments participating in developing that architecture. There are ideas like forest bonds that we're involved with. There are ideas like green banks, all of these things. What is the architecture going to look like from a finance side that's going to be able to support those kinds of developments in terms of land use that we've been talking about? Um, obviously, another level to think about is at the project level. I think that's where everybody is, is most comfortable. And what we're seeing more and more of is public agencies. Um, you think about the World Bank, you think about uh, the the bilateral institutions like USAID from the United States uh, and, uh, and others that are very interesting now and have, have started to actually move forward in thinking about instruments of de-risking. So when you think about an investment that, um, that maybe is a little tricky because of where it is or you've got all these other co-benefits that you want to start to, to monetize, there are public agencies that are, that are interested in partnering with you in developing that. 
Um, there also are voluntary standards. The, the, the nonprofit sector where I come from has been working many, many years on some of these ideas, and so we've created certification systems that we talked about like FSC, but also uh, interesting uh, standards and certification systems around things like water and biodiversity. We have launched something called the, the Business and Biodiversity uh, Global Standards uh, that, would, that would be a good uh, path to follow if you're thinking about your biodiversity impact of all of the activities you have. And, and finally, and maybe more most interesting to me is you know, if you think about it, you've got the global level, you've got the local level, there's another level that has been emerging uh, that I think is going to be very exciting for a, a company like, like uh, New Forest and a place like Australia and Tasmania, which is the idea of a jurisdictional approach to some of these things, a territorial approach. Um, this gets at this idea that we need to work at landscapes, and it, gets, it provides some real boundaries where we can operate at that landscape level, where you're working at a state level. There is a group called the, uh, the GCF, the Governor's Climate and Task Force, started in California, now includes 32 different states and provinces all around the world, places like uh, Mato Grosso in Brazil, uh, Central Kalimantan in Indonesia, that are moving forward as states and provinces to make commitments again. So you see another driver, and they're all committing to 80% reduction of emissions by 2020. They, are, they represent one half of the world's tropical forests. So there's another big driver in terms of what's going to be uh, coming down the pike from the, from the forest side. And it feels to me, you know, I, I came away from Tanzania, and, and, and what was very striking was there you got a great state, and you got, you got these incredibly productive soils, you've got incredibly productive agriculture, you've got these wonderful um, um, plantations, uh, you've got these old growth forests. Wouldn't it be interesting to think about Tasmania uh, to think about kind of a jurisdictional approach? That means that businesses, companies don't have to do their certification farm by farm, forest by forest. You could have Tasmania as a green uh, state, so you would, you would be able to enter into Tasmania and it would all be certified. So you wouldn't have to go through that extra hassle and all those experiences. So, so stay tuned for that. I think it's really, uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting way to kind of break this, this impasse where, you know, obviously at the global level it's too disconnected, at the local level it's too small scale. We have this middle scale that I think is going to be quite interesting going forward. And maybe I would just leave you guys, and I was, I was um, commenting to uh, a, a panelist earlier when they were saying, well, gee, wouldn't it be interesting if we just moved away from 10-year fund mechanisms and do them long term. I think we need to do those things. And I think we cannot wait for governments to create the regulations. We can't wait for businesses to do it themselves. I, th I think it's going to be the finance sector that's going to be the one that's going to be, uh, that's going to be most powerfully aligning us around this. So be bold, please. We really need it. We cannot be cautious at this stage. We will cook the planet if we do not act in a bold way. So I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for that fantastic presentation. If I could just get you to stay on the stage for a second. Oh, We're going to do the tricky part now of asking you a few questions in the audience. Are the microphones about? Yep, great. OK. Yep. Would anyone like to lead off with the first question for Michael? I'm searching, I'm searching. OK, while well, you guys think about it, how about I ask him one? And then uh, no doubt Mary-Kate down here in the front row will come up with another fantastic one. <laughs> <laughs> the role of government in the payment for ecosystem services, what have they contributed over the last 10 years and what should they, what should they be doing to contribute more? Uh, yeah, well, as I said, I, I would lead with the, you know, as we go to, to Paris, anybody that's been around that COP process since it started in Rio 24 years ago would say, would be, it would be very disappointing. Mm. I mean, we're going to go to that, we're going to go, after 24 years, all we can come up with is a set of sort of voluntary commitments. We can't, we can't as a globe, act together. So, so there's, there's a, a bit of a negative take on on the roles that government have played. But I, as I said, I think I'm seeing some 
interesting developments that are, that, are, that are state governments and local governments, municipalities and states that I think are going to be um, more effective at, at getting to where we want to go. But, they, but any of these markets, so we've been tracking the forest carbon uh, uh, market for you know, eight years now. Voluntary markets will not get to any scale that are significant. They're really important, really exciting. They're great in terms of developing all of the instruments like certification and standards. But if we're going to get to scale, we need to have that regulatory framework that becomes the real driver to get to scale. So critical. Is it possible that like our 10-year term funds, that the short-termism of governments and the election cycles are partly uh, yeah. responsible? No, I, I, you know, I was talking again to one of the panelists, and I think we, we are, the deck, is, the, you know, the deck is stacked against us. We, we won, we have financial systems, so we're all, everybody's doing quarterly reports, and everybody, we're all looking at our, at our returns every quarter, and you have, you know, I remember when, when forestry became an asset in the, you know, an asset class in the United States only 20 years ago when we could start to think about, and then, then came the TMO, so a, a 10 year cycle, which seemed incredibly long for most investors. So we have a problem in terms of the financial structures. We absolutely have a problem in terms of the political structures because trees don't grow in four years or two years or however, however long these terms are. So we need to start to think about, um, you know, and I guess this is where it's interesting on, to think about the, the group that's assembled here and, and the opportunity with a, finance, with a financing community that can create instruments that are in a sense, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a bit of a distance away from a political system that's going to be turning over in terms of their priorities on a regular basis. Yeah. Okay, Radha, a question over here. Michael, one of the uh, changes I think I've seen over the last 10 or 15 years is um, the advocacy sector actually looking at finance as a collaborator rather than, you know, the enemy. Yeah. Um, what do you view as the role of the advocacy sector in addressing some of the problems that we're talking about um, today? And, and what does the advocacy se sector need to do to address the complexity of challenges that we're facing today? Yeah, um, no, and I would, I would say not just the finance sector, but business. I mean, you know, I, 30 years ago when I was in the field in Paraguay working on, you know, business was, was the enemy. It was evil, right? Um, and I think that's changed a lot to where today I would say business is driving um, innovation. I mean, it's not coming from the government sector, and I think in the advocacy side and in the conservation side, frankly, I think we have ourselves sort of tied in knots. Um, as you know, Rada, we have a couple of, you know, when we formed the Board of Forest Trends, the idea was to bring all of these cast of characters together that cared about forests. So Randy Hayes, who was the founder of the Rainforest Action Network, and Sergei from Greenpeace Russia, our board members. And, and for me, the journey of Forest Trends is the journey that we all have to be on, where we start to think together about you know, the reality that we're in and what are they going to be the, the constructive solutions to what we want to do. And I think you see, you see evolution. I, you, know, you see it in Randy and Sergey, and I think that reflects the evolution also in the thinking of the advocacy groups. Always room for somebody to go out and, and, uh, and, you know, and attack the bad guy. Hopefully we've got the right target. Instead of just the big guys, you want to go after the bad actors. But, but at the same time, kind of steering them into the, the corral of other organizations like ours and, and groups that are out there that are working to try to come up with some of the solutions. Great. We've got another question just down the front here. Looks like Mary-Kate's going to get off this one. Oh, she's got one. Okay. Next. Uh, yeah, Rod Keenan, Melbourne University. Um, we're seeing a big shift in the source of global capital now from the developed world to the developing world. And um, good so you've had a very strong influence in Forest Trends and, and other advocates in the US on, on the historical sources of capital. I'm just wondering how you feel some of these arguments are going to play out in those emerging yeah. sources of capital in China and India in particular. Yeah, no, I think you're too kind to say that we've had an influence on those traditional sources, but um, you're exactly right. And, and we do a lot of work in China, we do a lot of work in Southeast Asia, Brazil and places like that, and what you find is that uh, it's, you know, the World Bank and the IFC, all of those players are really, frankly, less and less relevant. That it's the, the provincial banks in China that are funding their operations. And so, 
we are attempting to kind of break into those new areas. Um, China's, China's a very complex setting to do that. But, and you know, China just announced an, a new development bank, you know, the al alternative to the World Bank, and the funders are Russia and, and Brazil, and um, so it's, uh, uh, it's gonna be really important that all of what we've learned, all of the standards and the best practices get communicated into those new funding streams. Another question down here. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Mick. Um, I'm really intrigued by the idea of jurisdictional frameworks in a developed country, because I haven't thought about that a whole lot. So you putting it on Tasmania as a state has got me wondering. Think California. But, yeah. Um, I think they're connecting jurisdictional for other places beyond themselves in a way, rather right. than mandating what they do in their own borders, um, or our borders as a Californian. Um, I mean, Michael, what do you think that investors, particularly institutional investors, who are looking to own real assets should be doing to address forced risk commodities in their own portfolios? How do we address that in the absence of knowing what a regulatory framework might look like in 5, 10, or 15 years? Um, I, you know, I mentioned this project that we launched a number of years ago called BBOP, which is the Business and Biodiversity Offset Program, and we created a, a global standard. I think. For the, for the moment that we're in right now, if I was working with Dave, and, and I'm whispering in his ears a lot, but I would, I would take on all of those best practices that are out there. Um, FSC is, you know, is 20 years ago it was today, it, it was where Bebop is today. So, so adopt those best practices, because those are gonna be really important in terms of, you know, as you see right now, in terms of uh, access to markets, but it also is, um, it gives you license to operate in all of those places. And so those kinds of standards are what you should be looking for now. But if you think about a place like Tasmania, New Forest is going to be quite influential in the way that you think about that, that island and that, and that state. And I think it would be um, really interesting for a New Forest to start the dialogue with the advocacy organizations, the environmental organizations, the businesses, the government agencies to say, let's think about this as one landscape and, and let's make sure that we have all things in the right places and we're delivering all of the services and goods we want to our public. And so it can be a, an instigator of that kind of a jurisdictional approach. I, I sense that when I was there, you know, just those four days is that you guys are really in an interesting role. We have probably got time for one more question, otherwise we'll get on to the next panel. No, I think that's it. Please join me in thanking Michael.